Excellent. Um, well, let, let's do a quick preamble, which allows time for Inga to arrive within the first couple of minutes, and then we'll move on so she can be aggrieved that she's missed, missed something. So excellent. It looks like we've got a mixture of some of our local people and some of our new friends from the, the Observer course we ran for the people who would have gone to Aaron um, at the weekend. So it's very, very nice of them to drop in. Not all of them were actually in Scotland. We had Rob, who's dual purpose, um, but I don't think we've got our Eastbourne people. No. Okay. Excellent. So the idea of this was it's one of, oh, 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 that's Sharon Brown again. Oh, I think it's that. It's that, it's that, it's that. Oh, I'm sure that's, an, that's another Sharon Brown. <laughs> Might maybe, be the sound or something. Maybe the other one's not a real Sharon Brown. I'm trying to on the computer, not the phone. Ah, <laughs> excellent. Well, it's good, good to have whichever one of you wants to be involved. <laughs> Excellent. As I was saying, we do these short extra bits because we can do a whole weekend of marine ID. Um, but given the current unprecedented circumstances, it seems a good way of eking it out. And we sometimes do these just at the beginning of the year because committing to a whole um, day of marine ID is sometimes something people can't do, but a little bit, or little and often works out well so we've got a few of these um, the wednesday evening things more recently have been site guides to some of our, our local dive sites and we thought that having tricked you into being interested in normal diving we should try to persuade you to identify some of the things you see and get get a bit curious about those so our, our sea search people at the weekend have seen a few crustaceans um, our norfolk people will have seen lots of crustaceans and the Scots, not quite so many, but you get, a, you get an interesting, slightly different variety. So if we think we're settled. I think we're fine. Yeah, we've got two Robs, just the one Sharon. We're all ready to go. Um, so I'll share the PowerPoint that goes with this. And we'll see. Well, there's two more people at the top now. Oh, we've got That's two more people start. just arrived. I'll have to get those in a moment. We'll just start that presentation up on the wrong page no well, we can't because it's all confused i'll send that one home okay now let me let some more people in we've got lucy and mike c excellent let's let them settle in <clears throat> that's like crappy fun <laughs> <laughs> it does look very much like crappy fun from here. But they, they, they're not getting that view, I'm pleased to say. Excellent. I think everybody's in. I'll try and keep an eye on that while you're talking. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and keep an eye out. I can see people being interested and excited. Okay, everybody's in, so we're going to have some crabby fun. Um, we call these phylum corslets because phylums are the sort of subdivisions of the animal kingdom and I guess plant kingdom too, um, where things are significantly different enough to all be grouped together. And so we're going to start off by cheating because crustaceans aren't a phylum, they're a subphylum. Um, the phylum is arthropods, but that's absolutely massive. And we don't see all of those underwater anyway. So here we have our sort of main groups of animals. Some of them are bona fide phylums. Oh, Joanne's here. Let's admit Joanne. And we'll give her a moment and we'll start the talk again. So I, I think no, <laughs> no talk online is truly complete unless you've, you've tried to start it, it four or five <laughs> times now. Well, this is the general bit that she only had the other day anyway, so I think you're fine. Yes, it'll be, it'll be all right. So in the animal kingdom, we have significant groups, um, which we call phylums. Um, those are the animals which are different enough from each other that they're clearly set apart. Some of these groups are really, really big. And so like the crustaceans, fourth ones down, uh, they're actually part of a phylum called arthropods, which is all the jointed legs and that includes insects and crustaceans 
and a few other weird things. Um, but we're going to talk about crustacea, and crustacea are a subphylum, which means they're a, a group of the main part. Um, and because arthropods are absolutely huge, there's over a hundred thousand of them, and we we haven't got time this evening to go through all, th all of those, so we'll just do a bit. Um, the arthropods occur almost everywhere, so in salt and fresh water, and even on land. And that would be wood lice. Crustacean. Okay, the subculture. No, yes, yes. The wood lice are in crustacea, which is the subphylum. Um, they typically have a body divided into three segmented regions. So we, if you remember from the, the weekend for the observer people, we said worms were segment, segmented, and then the next stage on is crustaceans, and they have more specialized segments. So they, they look like a whole proper animal, but really they're just a super worm. And those three segmented regions are the head, thorax, and abdomen, which has a tail on the end. Those segments can be fused, so in the, the crabs, actually their head and thorax are all in one bundle. And we know the decapod group best, and those are the ones that we think have got 10 significant legs, and usually eight plain walkie ones and two pinchy ones. Um, but although that makes it sound like they've got five segments, they usually have around 19 because all the things they have are paired. So antennae and eyes, and so we need a diagram. That's what we need, a diagram to try to explain some of this. Oh, I've anticipated the diagram by a page. So each segment has a pair of appendages, which can be legs, antennae, mouth part skills, or even the dirty bits, even they have a segment. Um, they have sensory appendages to guide the animal to food, to mates, or in and out of trouble. Because they can't purse their lips, they've got a conveyor of small arms, which you can see around the, the mouth of this um, lobster here. A, a conveyor belt of small arms to pass food into the mouth. There's walking and swimming legs, which are attached to the thorax, including the claws, the key leg. Or chili. I think it probably chile. depends whether you're Italian or not. I've always heard it as chili. Abdominal pairs can be used for breathing and breeding. And so that's the bits underneath crabs that you don't eat, and the bits at the back of lobsters and prawns which whiffle around and help them swim. Now I think we're going to get a diagram. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. we're going to get a gratuitous claw picture. <laughs> Oh, good grief, we're still not getting a diagram. So the body parts can be harder to identify. The head is often fused with the thorax and abdomen under the carapace, which is the big oval bit that makes up the main part of the crab or the bit you eat in a lobster. Many crustaceans have a rostrum, which is a spiky nose that sticks out between their eyes and the spines and the teeth and the growth around the eyes and along that rostrum can be very important for identifying which one you're looking at. True crabs don't actually have tails, but many have a tail fan, a telson, at the end of the abdomen. So that's that what must be a diagram there. Must be a diagram. I was going to say the telson is the bit you hold onto of a barbecued prawn. Ah, at last, a diagram. So because they're segmented, and even their segments are segmented, there's loads of bits and loads of jargon. And if you want to ID crustaceans that are a bit odd and you go to a book, it helps to know what you're talking about. We won't go through all the names here, but you can see that there's plenty of them. Um, chief amongst them will be things like these anterolateral teeth. That just means teeth at the front and on the side. So if your crab has got spikes on, they can be useful. Sometimes the relative lengths of sections of the legs can be useful, but that's for a proper book. And most of the crabs we'll show you today are ones that you can pick out just by using your face and your eye holes. Crabs are easy enough, but prawns and lobsters, which are just really big prawns, get complicated because they've got legs with claws on, claws that are legs, 
and lots of spiky little wiggly bits. We're not going to run through them all, but you can see here that on the prawn, you can see the extra pleopods and swimmerettes, and they're used for breeding and breathing, storing eggs, and they actually have that tail, the telson, which if you're fishing for lobsters, you're supposed to mark and clip if you've got a female lobster, so it, it's thrown back in and marked and left for the whole season. Here we've got an aircraft spotter's guide to lobsters, and that means that not only can we see down from the top the arrangement of those paired legs, and they're almost completely symmetrical aside from the handed claws. There's a, a cutting claw and a crushing claw, and underneath the naughty bits. Um, the male are on one side, female are on the other of the separate sexes. They're not hermaphrodite. And the eggs would be caught up in the, the swimmerettes, pleopods, the breathing, the gills underneath. So there's a lot going on under a lobster. There's a lot going on inside a lobster as well. So we'll be off the diagrams pretty soon, but you can see that Actually, there's a lot going on. They've, they've got a brain, but they've also got a strong central nerve chain, which is why sort of it's not acceptable just to try and kill a lobster by boiling it to death. You've actually got to sever it in a couple of points for it not to be just plain boiled alive. Life's complicated. So if you're a crustacean, your outer shell is quite hard but not living and growing anymore. And so periodically it's shed a malt and replaced to allow body tissues to expand. A replacement is created inside the old shell. So occasionally on a beach, you'll find sort of a leathery crab case. And that's where one's been disturbed during malting. And the, in, the one inside is folded up and can expand but it can only expand once the old shell is forced off and that's forced off by water pressure which also blows the new one up um, because it needs to be maximally expanded so it can harden to provide that extra capacity. It can take days or even weeks to fully harden depending on the time of year and the species of crab and that time is also the opportunity for reproduction or sauciness as the scientists yeah. call it. And just on the right, you've got a couple of crabs preparing to be saucy, but crabs do it face to face. So this is just a, a, a nice cuddle. They're not getting grown up yet. Damage during a molt will persist until the next, but lost limbs can also be replaced in the same way. So if a crab loses a claw, he can grow it back. Over several molts. Yeah, over several molts. It'll be, it'll take time. You'd start to grow the leg back at the next molt, but it will only reach full size over the course of a few. Um, so a shore crab, I've read, might molt 18 times in a four year lifespan. And that molting becomes less and less often. Each molt can allow, roughly speaking, an increase of around 30%. So as the crab gets larger and larger, that's a larger and larger volume to fill and takes longer. Um, what this also means is that eating a clean crab is likely to be disappointing since a crab will only fill its shell towards the end of each sort of cycle. And one that's super clean might well be super empty as well. It'll take time to fill up. The sea gooseberry here is showing two tiny crabs which have hitched a ride. So they're early in their life cycle, post larvae, they're already little crabs, but they've got many more molts to go before they become sort of viable and safe down on the bottom. Tragically, there are plenty of groups of crabs, um, and we'll look through some of the common ones. So we've got barnacles, cirripedia. They sit on their backs, waving their cirri or legs in the air. We've got copepods. I'm not sure what the cope in that stands for or means. No, I don't know actually. Um, they're very small. Some of those parasitize sea slugs and we found a picture of that. So you need wonder no more 
what a parasitized sea slug looks like. Um, the mycid and opossum shrimps are things we often see on pretty much every dive, um, certainly around Norfolk and slightly around Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, particularly around in the shallows up in the kelp, buzzing mm. around with the, the gobies. Um, we see isopods, particularly idotia, which are like um, centipedes, and that's the group that has wood lice on land in it. And then we have amphipods, which include things like skeleton shrimps, the caprelids, jasa, which are small tube building little sort of bulldozers, and copepods. No, and amphipods. Other, other amphipods. Other amphipods. Yes, sorry, got my, got my slide mixed up. And the decapods. The decapods are the group we see most of, they're the biggest, and they include the caridae, the prawns and lobsters, the anastasias, the lobsters, it's not really anastasia, <laughs> anamura, hermit crabs and squat lobsters, and the porcelain crabs, don't forget porcelain crabs, and brachiora, which is the true crabs, and that includes a whole lot of weird ones like spider crabs, nut crabs, masked crabs, and some extra examples we've got, but not sea spiders. Why is that? Because sea spiders don't have a body, they're a completely separate group of animals. Yeah, if you get close to a sea spider, you'll see they really are just legs joined together. They don't have this arrangement that the, that the crustaceans do. So let's start. Barnacles might not be the most exciting looking crustaceans, but there's nearly 60 types and pretty much all of them are pretty hard to ID. Um, you have to look at them very closely, so you need a nice picture or fantastic eyesight or fantastic eyesight and a magnifying glass because it's all down to the shape of the aperture in the whole top, the, the doors that close that aperture and the plates that make up their conical little home. If you're a true masochist, you can download a PDF guide from the Field Studies Council. The Field Studies Council do quite a few nice books. They do the best crab book and they also allow downloading of some of their PDF guides of things which presumably they found they just couldn't sell. Um, there are a few easy examples of barnacles, like the one that exists in Devonshire cap corals, um, but that's, that's a bit specialist. We won't, we won't talk about that much more now. Barnacles are notoriously well-endowed hermaphrodites, like so many of the people we dive with. <laughs> mentioning no names. Um, this is the only picture I've ever seen of this kind of porn happening in the wild. So if I tell you that I've changed the names of these barnacles to protect their identities, but the one at the bottom left is called Fred, and the one at the top left is called Wilma. You can see she's got lovely legs. Those are her Siri, and that's what she fans the water with to collect food. Um, Fred is reaching out with his huge endowment to try to impress Wilma and so when she nips down the stairs in her little house and knocks, hears something knocking on the door, it will be Fred's monstrous intentions that do the deed. But barnacles are hermaphrodites, so in the fullness of time Fred will be Frida, Wilma will be William and he'll get his comeuppance, quite literally. Copepods are very small. We sometimes see their eggs, in fact, they're gonads on sea slugs. Those are the gonads of adult individuals which they've embedded into the nudibranch. And mostly we have foreign pictures from properly foreign, but here's one from Scotland. So this is an Antiopella cristata. And this little orange bunny here is those copepod gonads drilled into it. And this, this slug's not looking particularly well. It's really rather sort of bald and down wasted. and wasted down this side. Whether that's a coincidence or whether that's because it's being parasitized, I don't know. We'll have to have a look out for more pictures. On to the Malacostraca, the mycid or possum shrimps, and these act rather like little swirling fish. Um, normally close to the seabed or around some sort of kelpy medium. They're called opossum shrimps 
because they have a brood pouch, which makes them look a bit chubby and pot-bellied if you can actually catch them. Um, they're one to two centimeters long and they're pretty hard to photograph. They're a good way of having your hands and fingers freeze off in sort of on a decompression pause in the shallows when we dive in Scotland. Um, in most of our on Norfolk dives, which are comparatively shallow anyway, you'll see them buzzing around in little overhangs with prawns and ooh, crabs and maybe an eel. Yeah, conger eels often have a lot around their faces. Yes, I've just had a couple of boings. I wonder whether that's somebody in Facebook trying to, I'll to get in my contact. Phone. I'll have a go. A look, okay. uh, if it's Dawn's, it probably isn't. Yeah, but I, I do can think make it is. It quiet. Yes, I'm just going to let Dawn get up. <laughs> this is quite the acrobatic thing. Tell you what, I don't need to be sitting there, mm. so I'll stay out. Yeah. Anyway, now that Dawn's gone, she can come back on the other side. Um, one way of getting a good photograph of these is to find a cloud and just shoot into it. And that's, that's what I tend to do. That way you can usually find some of them that are in focus, better or worse, and you can see the arrangement. We'll come back to this. So we call these opossum shrimps and you can see their little legs stick out the side. We'll come back to that on shrimps in a moment. Isopods are insect-like animals and this is an idotia. Um, it's rather like an angry centipede and we see these usually early in the season in some of the rolling tumbleweeds of algae that come for drifting up the coast. They seem to prefer that to being down on the reef, but they hang around all year and it may be they occur in numbers early in the year and then they kill each other and only the big ones are left to bother the reef as a whole. Um, skeleton shrimps are much more common and much more well, seen much more regularly. Again, they're pretty hard to see. They seem to particularly like sponge. If you look at the, their back end, you can see they've got little short clasping legs which allow them to grip on to, to fingers of sponge and their fronts are rather praying mantis-like and they can be used to kill things. Um, that little one at the back there is pregnant, so you can see her, her bulging middle is filled with eggs, but she's still forced to work. It's, a, it's quite the the equal society in skeleton shrimps. This is a bundle of Jassa. We used to call these Jassa falcata, but sadly we found out there are three kinds that we can't really tell apart. So I'm sure you're going, well, what the hell's that? <laughs> but I'm moving my cursor around the individual and that's quite a big one. The rest of this brown stuff is a mass of little tubes. These animals build and live in tubes made of murky silt. Um, they're the kinds of things that cover dry suits after you've, you've dived a wreck. Um, and these sort of masses of tubes form on seaweed, anything they can, they can blanket really. Here's a slightly clearer one down at the tip of a purse sponge. What's the name of the purse sponge? Grantia compressor. Well done. And we've got a, a vase sponge over here. Siconciliata. Excellent. Just proving Dawn's still here. Oh, somebody's popped up. Chris has arrived. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, I think we've probably let Chris in. Um, we're not actually going to see him in the bath, thankfully. <clears throat> Excellent. So that's Jasser. They're uh, innumerably common. On, on lots and lots of dives, but not, hard, not, not easy to pick out and not easy to identify. Talking not easy to identify, this was a new one for us. This is Ampelesca. We did think it was a particular kind, but again, there are too many to tell without digging them up and getting an individual out. So this is the colony of tubes they build. And these are soft, flat-ended tubes a bit like party blowers and they feel like a doormat. These things are probably in three, four inches high and they carpet the seabed. 
Um, we had a year, a couple of years ago, when these grew and carpeted the seabed at Overstrand, and we've seen them down off Hampshire as well. <clears throat> a treat last year out sort of diving from some new sites was this. There's an Iphimedia obesa or Bisa, and these are tiny, maybe half a centimeter long. I think that, that would be a big one, wouldn't well, it? They are, they're reasonable. This, this <laughs> is a, a big one, so maybe three to five millimeters long. Mm. Nice looking but very tiny. You can see this one is clinging to the tube of a fanworm, uh, Sabella pavonina, and very attractive. It's a pity you can't always see the spiked back plates and its sort of insect compound eye properly at the same time. The caridae, the prawns, are another thing that you see on almost every dive, whether in Scotland or, or in Norfolk. So I guess top, top trumps amongst these would be the common prawn, Halimon serratus, and the rock pool prawn, which looks almost identical, Halimon elegans. The common prawn has a long nose. The elegant prawn just looks like that nose has been broken off. So here you can see this spike out the front of the common prawn. And just imagine that wasn't there. That's, <laughs> that's what a, a rock pool prawn would look like. And here we have again, you can see the yellow stripe up it. And it really is pretty much as simple as that being missing. It would give you a rock pool prawn. The rock pool prawns don't tend to live in deeper water um, and they're adapted to low oxygen living. Um, if they're caught in a drying rock pool, they wiggle their swimmerettes to oxygenate themselves, whereas the common prawn just lies there and probably dies, or at least pants a bit. The northern prawn, well obviously you can tell it's a northern prawn by the accent, and the pink bit in the middle. Otherwise, quite similar in size and shape to the common prawn. We saw some more last year, including Processor, which is a lovely little red prawn, and we have Hippolyte prawns, which are very variable. And in this instance, we have one photobombing this Processor prawn. So we saw this at night, that's probably five to eight millimeters long, not a very big prawn at all. No, really a small. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe a centimetre. It was really very small and okay. a, a royal pain to take pictures of. And then in the background at the top left, there's a Hippolyte various prawn, varian's prawn. And you can see just how horribly difficult they are to spot. <laughs> some are solid green, some are solid red, some are yellow, some have stripes, and some are utterly see-through without these specks on. They are horrible. And now onto shrimps. And I said that the prawns have legs coming out the bottom, so they tend to skip around in the water, hanging their legs down. Shrimps have their legs coming out the sides. And again, we've got a bonus shrimp for you, as well as the brown shrimp, Krangon Krangon, which hangs around in sand and is what people tend to sift around and use push nets for. Um, in amongst the sand, their camouflage is fantastic. And this is a hooded shrimp and you can see the legs are coming out the side it's resting on the bottom it's got some quite considerable claws at the front for a tiny animal how long is this one dawn mm, about three centimeters I think it's quite big yeah quite big but again like the other shrimp hard to find pretty well camouflaged i think sometimes you just really see the stripe moving mm. around and have to work out what the hell it's attached to and they're generally under boulders as well you have to turn a boulder to find one. Yeah, Dawn's big on turning boulders over and quite a few of the smaller crustaceans are things you just won't see if you look for them running around. Ah, the Anastasias. <laughs> Astacidae. Close enough. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Again, top amongst all the British crustacea is the common lobster. They can live 
if nobody eats them and nobody mucks them about till over 70. And in theory, they can live forever because they don't physiologically age like we do, which is rather neat. They have handed claws and they can't really be confused with anything. Um, I think we've had reports of crayfish down here, which have probably just been lobsters that have had their claws pulled off. Yes. And whether that's been done by fishermen, because you can pull the claws off a lobster and never have to account for the fact that it was undersized, or whether it's due to fighting with other lobsters, because those are the bits that get crunched up when they're fighting. We don't know. There's probably a bit of both. The American version of lobsters is very similar, although when you see them over here, normally they're cooked. Um, the American lobster industry is absolutely huge and very efficient, so they're able to keep their lobsters in store alive for nine months. Our industry is not very efficient, so they tend to be mostly available fresh near to the coast. As you can see, these handed claws, one side a crushing claw, which looks like it's got molars on it, and the other side a snipping or cutting claw, which has some really sharp, tiny serrations and it'll grow the crushing claw back by preference over the course of a malt or two. Yeah, that's what it does. That was quite a small one. This is a bigger one. Um, and usually in Norfolk, the lobsters run around in daytime. In most places, they're somewhat nocturnal, hiding away at night. The Anomura, the hermit crabs, squat lobsters and porcelain crabs. These are not true crabs. The common hermit crab is the only one of the hermit crabs that's easy-ish to identify. There's more than 20 others and all of those we'd call Pagorus spur. So the common hermit crab is Pagorus bernhardus and you can tell it's one of those because it's the big one. If your crab Hermit crab is about three inches long. It's a common hermit crab because they have to be that big to fill a whelk shell. Anything smaller, like this cute little thing in a winkle, that's a pagorous spur. It's just a hermit crab. There's a few dawn can tell apart and some you can identify by what, by what they wear, but those are few and far between. So if you've got a hermit crab, in a full-size whelk shell, it'll be the common hermit crab, and this one has big, rough legs, quite orange and quite spiky. Squat lobsters. Again, I've let, put in the spiny squat lobster for our Scottish people, but they're very rare down here. I must admit, I probably maybe see. We've seen three ever, I think. Yeah, three ever. So one a year would be spectacularly good in comparison with diving in Scotland where on a rocky site you'd hope to see a handful. Mm. They tend to be much more nervous than our more common the common or brown squat lobsters, Galathea squamifera, which we see maybe ooh, five, ten thousand on a dive. Yes. <laughs> um, they're not quite as nervous depending on the time of day. We also have a third one down here, Galathea intermedia, and perhaps you can see by the size of the sand nearby and these barnacle scars that these are a tiny squat lobster, maybe 20, 30 millimetres long. Yeah, 30 millimetres would be a massive one. Yeah, that would be a big one. And these are ID'd because they have five blue dots underneath. I think you can only see four on this yeah, one. Third one's around, that fifth one's around the corner under its chin. Yeah, so a bit further around, but four would be a good sign that there was a fifth available. These are very small, so small that you can see they're almost glassy clear. Mm. Lovely little animals, but again, very difficult to see, often under rocks. And often if you pick up a rock with one on, it'll run round. And as you turn the rock to see it, it'll run round to what's now the new underneath. So trying to take pictures of them is a thankless task. And because it takes dedication and skill, Dawn has all the good pictures of Galathea Intermedia. Porcelain crabs are another scuttly, underneath rock kind of animal, although on the wood reef of Cly, they're actually more obvious, aren't they? Because they live in the, the crevices in the wood. 
On dives, we've only seen the broad claw, or the long clawed on the left. We've only seen one broad clawed, and that was at Orford in some muck mm -hmm. on a, a shore collection. You can see the broad clawed is hairy, the long clawed is smooth. And again, they're very, very small. So body maybe body's pretty small, isn't it? The claws are massive. Body maybe a centimeter across, and then another centimeter either side with the claws sticking out on a big one. Yeah. If you look at this one, you can see it's got feeding fans. So these porcelain crabs behave very much like the tropical porcelain crabs, which are a size bigger, which you often see hanging around in anemones. So this is the way you'd normally see a broad clawed porcelain crab. Long clawed. Long clawed, um, which is lying down, being invisible and impossible to see. <laughs> so that's what it looks like, impossible to see. This one is a little more obvious because it started wandering around. You can see how disproportionately big the claws are compared with the little body. I think if it didn't have these thick, so powerful claws, it would almost look like a spider crab. Mm. The nut crabs. I remember that Tina song, Turner song, Nut Crab City Limits. <laughs> um, and these are such an odd looking crab. So these are the first of the true crabs. Yeah, into true crabs. Good point, Dawn. And so here, you sort of notice they have a diamond shaped body. And the males tend to have longer crabs, longer claws than the females. Slightly, and often a less inflated body shape. Ah, okay. So we haven't seen very many. How many have you ever seen, Dawn? Mm, ten, maybe. Yeah, so really they're very rare. This white one was convenient and easy to find, um, but more often they're sort of beige and typical crab coloured and they so blend in. This one's a female. It's got the two big lumps on the back of its shell, ah. like pseudo bosoms. If it were a male, the shell would be sort of flat and angular looking. Okay, so this is a buxom crab. Yes. A buxom. <laughs> crab. And so if you can notice a cleavage, then it's a female crab. <laughs> Probably, yes. Keep it together, we're being science here. <laughs> and so you think that one's really a male one? Yes, it's flatter. Yeah, Much no, flatter. No, no cleavage. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll ask Chris. He's an expert, an expert in this kind of thing later on. So perhaps he can shed some light on it. Um, yeah, so that's probably a male one and see a more conventional crab colour. <clears throat> sea toads, the sort of perhaps the largest of the spider crabs we see on this part of the coast. We don't see the big spiny spider crabs. And ironically, this, and you can see how small it is because of Dawn's hand, is the greater spider crab, higher Serranius. Up in Scotland, their, their highest crabs are four or five times as big. Mm. So we're very suspicious that we're confused. And it's not the first time we've been confused, but there doesn't seem to be another crab in the book to fill that gap. So these ones are masters of disguise. Um, I use this in all my talks to WIs and wildlife groups saying, you think your land animals are good at blending in, what about this? This one's looking down and to the left and is covered in a wide variety of sea squirts. This one's a bit of a mess. He's, he's decided sponge would make him blend in and it's just made him look cross. Then we get on to the spider crabs, the kind of tarantula sized spider crabs that give some people the willies but we find highly amusing. So you get long-legged or weedy ones which are like this um, and their legs tend to tent. Just like a very big spider. Like a big spider. The others are the inacus and they tend to wear sponge more often and they have their legs out to the sides. So and Again, these behave differently down here from up in Scotland. Down here, ours, we, we never see them marching about. They tend to be very sedentary, arms out, covered in sponge. Up in Scotland, 
they move across sediment seabeds covered in filth. Mm. They really are <laughs> like little walking sort of waste paper baskets. It's like their legs are made of caddis, caddis fly tubes or something. Yeah, they're very, I mean, these seem to have stuck particular kinds of sponge in particular kinds of areas. Mm. And the Scots ones are a mass of shell and gravel debris along their arms. So better, better camouflage for where they are, but their behaviour is different as well. They seem to sort of scan across the bottom. Um, this is a, another Macropodia, and you see this one's decided it would use only one kind of weed. And amazingly, this is a picture we took two years before we discovered this seaweed existed in Norfolk. <laughs> How red were our faces? This is moving across the sand, but this animal will be moving from one patch of seaweed to another. And these crabs are ones where the Macropodia sort of genus or the Anacus genus are as far as we can go because we're not expert enough to identify these crabs more accurately. So if you're putting them on your forms, which I hope you will be, then the ones that tainty legs are Macropodia, big legs, and the other ones, probably sponge covered, are Inacus. And some things we just can't ID to individual species underwater. This will become a recurring theme. And then there's the big spiny spider crab, which is Maha Brachydactylia, Brachydactyla, um, which was, had been misnamed probably for decades around the UK until someone realised it was actually a different species from Squinado, which was in the Mediterranean. So these are honking great crabs. I mean, their reach on their arms could be at least a metre. Um, and they gather in aggregations around Wales and the southwest. Occasionally seen in Scotland, but not super common. Mm, I believe so. We've never seen one, but I think they are up there. Yeah. Our sort of biggest crab is the edible crab, and sometimes known as the brown crab, the pie crab, the chroma crab, or even the canker crab. Um, obviously dissimilar from pretty much all the other crabs, even when it's little. It has this sort of broad oval shell that's a lot wider than it is deep has black tips to its claws, except when it has white tips. And apparently fishermen don't like white tipped crabs because maybe it means they're just freshly malted. But it could, could, mean, could mean anything. Yeah. The fishermen are filled with old tails. You can see how small this crab is because that's not actually a normal human being's hand. That's Dawn's hand. So this is a crab that's actually microscopic. That tongue poke was completely wasted. <laughs> And here we've got a couple of edible crabs, and this is just a pre-sauciness cuddle, because crabs play face to face, so this male crab is just protecting his lady friend until she changes, and then he'll have a go. Velvet crabs are everybody's favourite aggro crab, and um, despite the name, called a velvet crab, but they're just stubbly on top, not velvet here at all really. They've got these nice paddly back legs, but they, they don't really swim. I don't think I've ever seen one swim. Not they, they just reach up and try and grab you, and then if you wave at them, they'll run off. So they're a frightened, annoyed, stubbly, scrappy little crab. But occasionally it's with good reason. Here, this is a female, and she's got a bundle of eggs under her tail. Because although crabs don't have a, a tail they show, it's actually folded up underneath. And a female crab has a broad tail, so she can sort of contain a good bundle of eggs. And that's a decent place to protect them because it's between these pinchy arms. So she's got an expression very much like my mother. <laughs> <clears throat> and they'll eat anything, even a pipefish. A well-rotted pipefish. A well-rotted pipefish. And do you well-rotted, one of the cheery Fishermen around Norfolk once said to me, oh, crab catch, not like it used to be. And I said, yeah, not since they moved the sewage pipe three miles offshore. And he was forced to agree. This is the flying crab. And I'm not sure we'd ever heard of it. So I don't expect all of you have heard of it. 
And this is what we thought was the harbour crab for well over 10 years. Um, as it turns out, this nice neat crab is Leocarcenus pulsatus. It's the same shape as the harbour crab, but it's got a slightly different colour scheme. So its back legs have a, just a splash of eyeshadow on, but otherwise it's sort of pale, usually pretty clean. Um, this is, must be a freshly malted one because it's super clean. Quite angular arms, uh, but different from the harbour crab, which is altogether slightly more colourful. So this is one from Scotland and is the one you'll find in books. So Leo Carcinus Deparator. And you can see his back legs have got more, more exaggerated eyeshadow. Bright blue. Bright blue. Grey blue. Yeah, so more a sort of Essex nightclub makeup than that subtle sort of family meeting kind of thing. So definitely far more orange and red than our flying crabs. Then we've got shore crabs. Shore crabs are the scrappy, busy little crabs you get almost everywhere and must be in three or four different predominant colours. They can be almost white, they can be bright orange, they can be green. They're sometimes called the green crab. They are what fishermen call peeler crabs because they find them hold away waiting to complete molts. Um, small crabs. Maybe sort of a, a huge one would be three inches across the shell. Mm. And here we have some pawn just to get you going before we move into our final selection of crabs. And yes, it's actually going on. I won't tell you their names to protect their identities. The masked crab's rather a, an interesting looking animal. This diagram nicely shows how oddly shaped its shell is. So this one is deeper than it is wide. Some pretty good thorny spikes on the side and these two huge near parallel antennae. When you see them, they're usually on the move. They hunt in the sand, so you don't normally see them on rocks. And if you catch them from the right angle, you can see those antennae just stick straight out. They bury very fast, so there's probably a lot more of them about than we've ever seen. Dawn says this one is a girl because the males have much longer claws. This is disappointing. Mm -hmm. This is Portumnus Latipes, um, related to Queen Latifah, the American rap star. Not really. Uh, this is Pennant's swimming crab and the defining feature of this is some very nice polka dots on the back of its shell but we couldn't quickly find um, the picture that showed that. So this is an aggrieved crab behaving just as a penance swimming crab would do, because these bury themselves very fast. And so it's a, a beige colour with white, quite large polka dots on its back, isn't it? It's quite normally a very clean looking crab. I, this is the only one I've ever seen growing anything. Yeah, so there you are. Feel hard done by. This crab has disguised itself so we couldn't do its ID properly. Um, if you see one, they'll try to bury very fast. If you slip your hand under them in the sand and bring them up again, they'll be sort of nonplussed for a minute, but then they'll try to bury themselves again very fast, so you won't see them for very long. Ah, last but not, le not least, the hairy crab. Um, you can see it's hairy. Um, and has chocolate brown claw tips. I mention this now because Dawn says um, they get less hairy with age. Um, this one isn't showing its claw tips, which is extremely inconsiderate, but you can at least see how hairy it is. Um, it looks like it's more complicated, but its hair's covered in crud. Again, so a small crab, muscular arms, and this is around a normal size for one, isn't it? They're not big crabs. They're not very big. Yeah, so that's maybe nearly two centimetres across. Yeah, I guess they get up to a couple of inches across for a, a big one. Yeah, they'd be really rare to see one mm. that size. But I mean, look how powerful this, these claws are. Mm. Very chubby compared with the size of body. Almost as much claw as there is animal. Mm. 
So if you want to be a crab expert, this is the book to get. It's published by the Field Studies Council. It's a field, gu a field guide to and a key to crabs. So you can use the things you've spotted about a crab to work your way through the size of legs, and it will ask you questions about the length of relative sections of legs. So be prepared to flick to the back to check the pictures, which are pretty good, um, and then flick forward again to double check you've done the right thing. The Collins Seashore Guide is also very good on crabs, includes lots of different types, um, not so much information on ID, but shows you just how many they are. And loads of prawns in there as well. Aren't there? Lots and lots of prawns. Um, the Field Studies Council do a downloadable hermit crab guide as a PDF and that barnacle guide too. So if you want to be an expert, that's the place to go. And one thing you should remember is that the thing that sets the crustaceans aside as a group are these sort of common factors. And what we try to teach in the observer course and all the ID courses is work from first principles. So if you've got a thing that you think you should recognize, run through the basic stuff that you probably remember. Has it got a hard skeleton? How is that laid out? Is it obviously segmented? By that time, you've pretty much got a, a crustacean. And counting the legs isn't always a go-to. The decapoda, the big crabs and lobsters are pretty easy, but things like squat lobsters and the funny little crabs often hide a pair round the back, mm. so you don't see those. And they're small as well, aren't they, compared to the others? Terribly wee, terribly wee. I think That's you're it. done. So we'll stop sharing. And magically, we've swapped sides. <laughs> okay, so I mean, that's all we were going to subject you to this evening. Has anybody got any questions? Did you mute everyone? I, I didn't. They all muted themselves really oh, nicely. People good. are so civilised mm -hmm. now. I remember a couple of weeks ago, everybody had come into a conference shouting, shouting with their kids in the background, <laughs> playing loud music. Um, yeah, so honestly, that's that that's the whole thing. We've well, run to time. It's amazing. Yeah, well, it's only pretend time. Only pretend time. So if you're all happy, we'll leave you to it. Next week, we haven't decided whether we'll do another group of animals or a site. Or seaweed. Or seaweed. There was a lot of interest in seaweed. And so we'd talk about pressing yeah. seaweed. I mean, seaweed will happen quite soon, even if even if we do a site next week. We'll see, because we're, even in going through this, we added half a dozen different crabs that weren't in the version of this we prepared a couple of years ago. Um, so things just keep appearing. appearing and ganging up on us. So it's a live piece of study, and hopefully you're super keen on crustaceans now. Um, okay, right. I, know, I think a couple of people have unmuted themselves, so go ahead. I was, I was going to say the slides that you presented, are they going to be shared or be available somewhere? I must admit, we, we don't normally do that. We take no. out the book. That, yeah. That's kind of a digest. Um, the the presentation is kind of a, a live thing and sure. we realised that when we came to look at it, it, <laughs> it was, was full of errors. Yeah, full of errors and quite up, out of date. <laughs> so we did rush through it tonight to put all the extra bits in. Mm. Yeah, and we'll keep... Oh, that's fair enough. Up. Okay. That was that was totally cool, Rob. And um, thank you very much for that presentation. Really enjoyed it and the humour. Um, oh, great! We were wondering, we were wondering um, if the so if you're if you're wandering a beach and you stumble across a um, a crab shell or a crustacean shell, um, is it likely that that's the product of a molting event or is it a predated crab? Um, it's, a molt. it's most likely to be a molt if it's intact. Oh, cool. um, I think when, whenever I've seen one crab eating another crab, generally the, the, the meaty bit's the body, and so that gets damaged. Um, uh, if it's cooked, then it's something somebody's thrown back in the sea and it's washed up again. Yeah, that, that's a worthwhile point. Around Norfolk, the fishermen um, do their processing and then take the waste out to sea to dump it. So you can come across sort of middens of intact crab shells. Although I think, to be fair, if they're doing dressed crabs, they'll keep the top and they throw the, the legs and claws away. 
Um, but yeah, the little crabs that wash ashore, like mainly shore crabs, velvet crabs, and if you're lucky, a spider crab, will mostly be molts. Mm. Or if the crab is intact and stinks, <laughs> then it's <laughs> right. That's the thing. Great, thank you. Okay. Oh, cheers. Thanks. Ooh. Anyone else? No, oh, was good. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. it. Great. Okay, well, well, we'll let you all off if you're, if you're happy. Um, thanks all for coming along. It's been nice to see you. We'll put out some details for the one for next week, unless, of course, coronavirus is cured and we can all go out, in which case, well, we'll just drop you like a, <laughs> <laughs> like a bag of washing. Okay. Have fun. See you all around. We have a chat. Oh, thanks very much. Ooh, it's thanks, nice. guys. Oh, thanks thanks very much. Sure. Thanks from Penny. Thanks from Lisa. Nice. Nice of you to come along. Thanks, folks. Bye bye then. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. bye all. Bye. <laughs> thanks very much. Bye. Bye, Penny. Bye bye. Bye. Ooh, a close up of Penny's fingers. <laughs> Excellent. So everybody was so well behaved. Ooh. That was that was lovely. That's the quietest one ever, I think. No, yeah, well, everybody's just so nice now. Yeah. They've completely changed. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll end it myself now. So thanks ever so much for coming along, and we'll see you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.